without any more ado, I would like to ask for Mr. Grady. I'd like to ask him for uh, personal reflections on Russian youth and uh, perceptions of reality in the world by the Russians. Mr. Grady's mother was kind enough to show us a vignette into, into Jan Karski's life a few years ago when it wasn't that sexy. But now it's sexy, so we were the first to be informed. Uh, she's a photographer, a fantastic collection. And now she brought her son to IWP to meet us. And his was a very interesting story. He spent some time in Putin's Russia. I uh, think I have, let me see. I don't have, oh yes, Mr. Uh, Grady finished Trinity College in Dublin. That's where Edmund Burke attended, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very lovely school. He was at Moscow State University, Gasodatien, between September uh, 2012 and June, 2000, June 2013. Earlier he studied in Italy, in Bologna, and he was also here in Bolis, uh, at Bolis School in Potomac. He will tell you all about all the important stuff. Peace. Well, I will do my best. I want to thank Dr. Hodakovich for being here. Um, and I warn you that I am an artist, so I might also be clinically insane. Um, one moment. Um, I should say this is not actually about Poland. Um, it is about Russia, though. And I think that, as we all know, there are many connections, both historically and today, um, some of which are positive, some of which are not so positive. And I do think it is relevant today to speak about Russia. I don't know, do we have any Russian speakers in the room? Anyone understand Russian? Great, OK. I added uh, a stranger among one's own to the title of this presentation, but I will basically explain later as to the significance of that. Um, all right, um, at the end of September, I finally decided to leave a country that I love. I, um, I could tell you about the plummeting currency um, and the dwindling career opportunities, but my main reason was a marked change in the society in which I lived. The Russia I moved to in 2011 was full of exhilaration. After years of economic and political upheaval, and 70 years before that of alternate violence and boredom, so many Russians before had never been so wealthy, so worldly, and so successful in the Western sense of the word. The Russia I left was fundamentally different. It had changed politically, economically, and most importantly, socially. The last, this last aspect is both the most interesting and the hardest to quantify, as all Russians harbor a deep mistrust of surveys. However, I was vastly assisted by what I can only describe as the Russian national characteristic. This is their brutal honesty, which I think is world famous. Um, were I to speak with 100 Italians or Irish or Americans, I would undoubtedly get a story confined to what they deemed appropriate to tell me. However, everyone in Russia seems to agree with Charlton Heston. Political <laughs> correctness is tyranny with manners. Um, therefore, while I will analyze the views and ideas of the younger generations of Russian society primarily based on anecdotal sources, please remember that all of my interactions with oligarchs young professionals, students, colleagues, and cleaning ladies were often as candid as if they were with my closest friends. It is also important to note that in preparing this speech, I found a range of statistical information that supported, thank God, the conclusions I'd come to in my two and a half years in Moscow. Now, unlike many people in this room, I do not hold a formal degree in international relations or politics. I started my bachelor's, sorry? Wonderful, it makes two of us. I started my bachelor's degree in history of art and Italian at Trinity College Dublin in 2009 and was fairly oblivious to the, to the strategic and societal boundaries that sharply divide Europe. Anyone who has been to Ireland, which I hope people have been, um, knows that today it is a good-natured, relaxed place where the pub takes precedence over politics. 
So we have a typical scene in Dublin. Uh, this is not as international as it looks. It's just a pub. It's not Geneva. Um, so um, Western Europe, for all of its cultural interests, didn't satisfy my curiosity about the other end of the continent. I, so one summer, having finished a job in Milan, I traveled to St. Petersburg to study Russian at St. Petersburg State Polytechnic University. It was a short two-month course, and it was rather like opening the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when I was a child. I had to go to school, and I had to do homework, but all I really wanted to do was go back to Narnia. So um, I was delighted to learn of an exchange program between Trinity College and Moscow State University. It was to be off books. That is, I would take a year out of university. And it was fully funded by the Russian government. Russia is actually very handy that way. There are a lot of things that are secretly free. And um, I applied, and I was very nervous about uh, whether or not I'd be accepted until I was watching Khodorkovsky's documentary. And an Irish flatmate turned to me and said, you want to go there? And this is what she had in mind. And um, now, this is Nariusk. This is the Krasnoyarsky Krai. This is not representative of all of Russia. Um, now, Irish people have a tendency to avoid cold and politically hostile countries, but many did not realize what they missed. So this is where I studied. I think it's the most giant university building in the world. Um, and I studied there for a year, from 2012 to 2013. I was able to speak Russian at a utilitarian level in about two months. And I soon found that far from studying the history of art, which I was technically supposed to be doing there, I, um, I was following Russian news sources and blogs. I discovered that there were, in fact, two worlds. The world of truth that was convenient for Western nations and the world of truth that was convenient for Russia and certain other developing nations. It was by, fo by closely following these two divergent streams of propaganda that I began to understand the bipolar position that modern-day Russians find themselves in. Now, anyone who's been following developments in Eurasia knows that 2013 was a really good year for Russia. After leaving deeply recessed Europe, it seemed to me that an endless stream of Russian rubles floated through the Moscow streets. All you had to do was reach out and grab them, and they were yours. So I accepted a wide variety of jobs, and met Moscovites, Petersburgians, Siberians, Caucasians. And then to understand the country better, um, I traveled within Russia to nearby Yasnaya Polyana, Vladimir, Nizhny, Veliki, Novgorod, Kastorma, Arkhangelsk, and the Northern Caucasus. My predominantly negative stereotypes of the former Soviet Union, which I think are understandable, um, were shattered by the sincerity and generosity of the many locals I met in Armenia, Georgia, Ukraine, Serbia, Lithuania, and Latvia. Now, I traveled with Russians to all these places, and I frequently met young Russians in them. Therefore, they provided a dramatic counterbalance to the Moscow existence I took, I naively took, to be representative of all Russia. Now, I went back to Ireland for a year. I attracted puzzled stares sitting, sitting in on Russian politics courses. Um, and I took my exile from Russia to read many of the classics of Russian literature, which I think any Russian student does. Um, and I will say that um, nothing I've read is more relevant to um, modern day Russian society than Nikolai Gogol's Dead Souls. That was my discovery that year. Um, now, this year passed quickly into the horror of my mother and father. I went back to Russia. Now, the year 2014 had radically altered life in Russia. Now, the economy fell to the floor, as everyone knows, and the ruble became the worst performing currency of the year, only to be outdone by the Ukrainian hryvnia. The economic implosion forced all private companies to slash budgets, which led to the liquidation of all my former jobs, with the exception of English teaching. While I cannot say I was pleased at this development, the collapse of the ruble led to a mass exodus of English speakers. My masochistic desire to remain and watch everything fall apart made me very much in demand. Now, this is just an example of a typical exchange rate, as we can see. And when I arrived in Russia, it was 32 rubles per dollar, and here we have 82. So salaries did not change numerically, yes, but the value obviously was very different. Um, now, um, the economic crisis was accompanied by a peculiarly Russian paradox. During this time, Moscow acquired a European skin. Anti-smoking laws and luxurious infrastructure projects, such as the restoration of urban palaces and extensive use of marble and granite in underpasses, 
vastly improved the city's urban environment. So we had essentially the whole, all of Moscow was a sort of construction site for a good year. And then we have the result. Oh no. Okay, so this is your result. Yeah. So as we can see, it does look exceptionally European and probably contrary to many of our stereotypes. So um, at the same time, the decision to annex impoverished Crimea and the ongoing war with brotherly Ukraine seriously challenged the personal beliefs of every Russian. I say every Russian because Russians, like Americans, are very politicized. Um, in America, we can probably agree that this heightened awareness of politics is due to an inborn sense of political empowerment. In Russia, this stems from vulnerability. Apart from the shared Soviet past, Vulnerability is the single characteristic that unifies every Russian, whether a Moscow oligarch, a Kamchatkan fisherman, a Dagestani farmer, or a St. Petersburg hipster. This is first and foremost economic vulnerability. Oscar Wilde, who most definitely had a Russian soul, wrote this. Anyone who lives within their means suffers from a lack of imagination. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and also, all of Russia couldn't agree more. So all of my Russian friends and acquaintances, without exception, um, share this mentality. Um, a salary in rubles is kind of like being paid in ice cream. It, you have to eat it all right away, or else it melts. So we have, this is, I mean, Yandex has a wonderful, um, the course, the yeah, exchange right here. And you can see that the ruble is constantly weakening. Yeah, it doesn't ever get stronger, really. So, um, if you have a lot of self-control, you can look around for a freezer for your ice cream. And there are a lot of options. There are dollars, there are euros, there are apartments, there are luxury goods. Um, but my personal experiences lead me to believe, which is two years of, a lot of looking at this course, looking at this exchange rate, um, is that no, no financial resource within the territory of the Russian Federation can be considered safe. Okay. Now, um, therefore, when we consider Russian youth, we must first remember that these are young people, just like here and in Europe, but who have lived their entire lives under an abstract but ever-present cloud of economic insecurity, regardless of the incomes of their parents. To analyze the youngest members of Russian society, we must first determine who qualifies as youth. In America, youth seems to end at 18. Then we travel to other ends of the country and get serious about what we're going to do with our lives. And by contrast, in the gerontocracy of the Mediterranean nations, everyone under 40 is considered still wet behind the ears. So what about Russia? In Russia, youth is sharply divided. During the 70-year Soviet regime, there was not a concept of work experience as we know it until you finished school or university. Therefore, not one of my students under 21 had worked a day in his or her life. Um, now, it's also important to remember the internal migration in Russia. Um, this is a country that expands 11 time zones and only offers one viable destination for a career. And this is because it's viable because only in Moscow are wages significantly higher than your cost of living. So no one, I mean, we think of St. Petersburg, we think of Novosibirsk, but no one would move there unless they're very romantic and they love history and that's why they're in St. Petersburg, um, because it doesn't make any sense financially. Okay, so that everyone goes to Moscow. And um, therefore, many young Russians are compelled to move to the faraway capital city and grow up fast in their early 20s. In the light of this division, I will designate the first period of Russian youth as adolescence, which lasts from 15 to 25 years, sorry, 21 years. This is a group of primary importance as it does not remember the Soviet Union nor the economic and political cataclysms of the 90s. The second period, young adulthood, will incorporate Russians from 21 to 35 years. I use 35 as an end mark because middle-aged Russians exhibit a far more pronounced Soviet stamp than those with little memory of the former regime. This Sovietsky Chelovyak, or Soviet man, as referred to in contemporary Russia, tends to exhibit very extreme attributes. I mean, you have deep cynicism and repression on the one side, and often incredible generosity and patriotism on the other. Um, but his cardinal feature is ignorance. And I say this in the most neutral um, sense of the term, because global media and the accessibility of transport has by and large not reached the Russian older generations. So um, I must admit the adolescents I came into contact with were far more homogenous than the young adults. This is for the simple reason that they were my students. 
Um, these were the children of middle and upper, upper class Muscovite parents of Slavonic extraction. They were, in effect, members of the new Russian bourgeoisie, sons and daughters of Moscow's army of middle managers and small time CEOs, all of whom seemed to be employed somewhere along the financial chain between the sale of natural resources and the purchase of foreign manufactured goods. I'll also note, in case we're interested, that uh, I had several oligarchs as students, including the wife of the governor of Kamchatka, which was quite an experience, um, but never their children, um, because they were primarily sent to boarding school in the UK. Okay? Now, upon further reflection on the adolescent generation, I added the phrase, or a stranger among one's own, to the title of this presentation. I did not realize that it was actually the Russian title for the Homeland TV series. Um, this phrase originates from a longer expression, um, one's on, which reads, one's own among strangers and a stranger among one's own, and accurately describes the position of many of the Russian adolescents whom I have met. So we'll look at this uh, Rushovka. This is a building built during Rushov's time. Um, and the reason I bring... Yes, yeah. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because um, they are everywhere <laughs> in, in, in Russia. And, um, and you have to imagine what your world is like when this is your surroundings. And you can also imagine this place times maybe a million and you get that building. So we have really, really gigantic Soviet projects um, in Moscow. Though I'll, I'll stop right now and just mention, if you're interested, that this is actually inspired by French architecture. Um, which is very few people know, but this is actually where it comes from. Now, these didn't catch on in France, um, but in Russia, the great number, scale, and faceless quality of these buildings overwhelm the resident with one very specific feeling, which is this. You are not special. Yes? Now, this might be a healthy message to send to European and American youth, but in Russia, it tacitly perpetuates a culture of enforced homogeneity or oppression by the majority. Now, um, we cannot forget that most adolescents in Russia tend to spend more time looking at their phones than they do outside. And like youth all over the world, when they are outside, they tend to be looking at their phones more than they do their surroundings. Now, this leads to an arresting bipolarity. In their extensive virtual lives, they see this. So we have sort of hipstery people in Europe or London, I don't know. Um, so they choose to dress that way. So Moscow is full of people dressed like this, but it looks like that in Russia, which is a bit, a bit of a contrast, you could say. Um, now, I have focused here on the hipster subculture, as it is extremely popular in, among Moscow youth, and its ideals, which are alternative music and fashion, progressive political views, and unconventional lifestyles, are in direct opposition to the, values of the, the official values of the current regime, and those of the Soviet generation. This is where the gulf between the old and the new Russias is dramatic. Um, and this you will see every day in Russia. You will see that it, it's like two separate countries. Um, now, um, so how do the wealthy Russian adolescents I met perceive their reality? Um, the answer is, except for a few cases, with pronounced negativity. They often dream of living in London, New York, or, or Europe, which means Germany, and um, many refer to Moscow and Russia at large as a whole, a dump, yeah? Um, in spite of Russia's rich culture, these ideas do not come as a surprise because due to its close proximity to nations such as Finland, which have a much higher standard of living. Now, the attention of Russian adolescents is almost entirely claimed by this cultural bipolarity, as they lack any professional experience. This common internal struggle was accurately described by modern Russian journalist and TV producer Leonid Parfionov in an interpretation of the 19th century Slavophile slogan. So, again, 19th century, we have the Zapadin Loy, the West is rotten, which was then colloquially altered in Soviet times to Zapadin Loy, a pachten show. The West is rotten, but it sure smells good. Um, as soon as the adolescent crosses over into adulthood, his or her perspective evolves dramatically. The most strident characteristic of my acquaintances in their early 20s was an extreme politicization coupled with a total absence of political empowerment. The political paradox of Russian youth summarized is as follows. Every Russian from 20, 20 to 25 considers himself or herself an expert. Um, 
he or she will always complain to you about how terrible everything is. But he or she does not believe in any possibility of change. And he or she wants Russia to be like Europe, but does not believe in democracy, minority rights, or paying for things such as public services taxes. And this is from direct experience, so I'm not, I'm not stereotyping here. Um, the most fertile ground for debate, and thus the source of these conclusions, was undoubtedly my evening classes in Moscow. They attracted a motley assortment of students and young professionals resident in Moscow, but from all over Russia, and represented a broader political spectrum than my own local friends. These classes were meant to follow certain business topics, ranging from meeting etiquette to environmental awareness. The topics rapidly lost their relevance as the currency plummeted, prices soared, war broke out with Ukraine, and Russian counter sanctions removed nearly all high quality products from the supermarket shelves. This was a very sad and very common sight. Um, now, this last event, which left the ingredients of borscht and some withered South American vegetables, was particularly painful for a young generation obsessed with and accustomed to Italian cuisine and sushi. Um, now, it was in this environment that I first heard democracy questioned as an institution. Um, many young Russians deem the intimate relationship between corporations and political candidates in the United States as a rough equivalent to the rampant crony capitalism in their own country. The dynastic quality associated with presidents and powerful politicians of the same family further undermines the informed Russians' confidence in American claims to democracy. This trend includes the Roosevelts and the Kennedys and has recently been represented by the Bushes and the Clintons. Finally, those who do believe in democratic election wonder whether it produces effective leaders. Um, given the prevalence of pop culture celebrities such as Ronald Reagan, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Donald Trump holding or aspiring to hold important American political positions. Um, now, it is likewise unsurprising that Moscow's 800-year history of autocratic rule has influenced the opinions of the current youngest generations. The czar or general secretary or president has traditionally been viewed as a benevolent dictator. That is, someone who has the best interests of the country at heart while standing up to foreign aggressors. Thus, many young Russians tacitly support Putin in this way, believing it irresponsible to leave the power of the country in the hands of the politically incompetent masses. Therefore, before I go into what Russian young people believe regarding minority rights, it is important to note a serious misconception of many Westerners. Dialogues about the condition of minorities in Russia and various other nations tend to assume that the big bad dictator forces his nefarious agenda on the powerless populace. In reality, most Russians and even members of various minority groups do not feel oppressed and indeed strongly support the decisions of the government. It is by and large Westerners who feel oppressed living in Russian society. And it is members of Russian society, not the government, who are the source of these feelings. All right? Now, um, we can't talk about minority rights without first considering the priorities of the average person. Now, we probably, most of us probably know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is probably very um, familiar. And whether or not you believe in this, it's very relevant when we talk about Russia. Um, there is a sense of security in America and many Western European nations, which comes from the established precedent that the state protects its <coughs> citizens. Any brief foray into modern Russian or Soviet history proves the opposite in the case of Russian citizens, who are vulnerable to the whims of anyone with power, from politicians to policemen. This wild east is a fragile balance between the erratic businessmen in power and the potentially volatile masses rendering life in the Russian Federation similar to life in a dilapidated building. The ever-present danger of collapse leads many young Russians to believe that any attempt at change puts everyone at risk. Thus, while I heard many complaints directed at Vladimir Putin during my time in Russia, these died out into an uneasy silence during his mysterious 10-day hiatus in March last year. Most Russians are so focused on the lower two categories, that is safeguarding their personal belongings and living, um, that common Western concerns such as minority rights, environmental protection, and philanthropy are not only irrelevant, but often incomprehensible to the average Russian outside of Moscow. 
And the common interest, as we can see here, is in maintaining the status quo. Now, I was very much helped um, by this Atlas of European Values, which I admit is a bunch of surveys. So yes, there were some Russians who did take a survey. Um, as I've said, um, young Russians are apathetic to political activism in their own country, but are extremely interested in pan-European politics and society. Europe itself has undergone fundamental changes in the, in the last quarter century, including increased secularization, immigration, and minority rights. The progressive concepts of political correctness and tolerance are entirely foreign even to Russian young adults, who view the first as hypocrisy and the second as degeneration, or as the Russian Orthodox Church calls it, moral nihilism. Now, um, I'll present this very quickly. Uh, this is essentially a map of those citizens who think that order is the most important goal in the next 10 years. As we can see, it is overwhelmingly Russia and Scandinavia and Turkey who believe this. In the vast majority of the West, order is not the prime of primary importance. Now, if we keep going, um, the next one is about how whether children should learn about tolerance and respect for others at home. Again, we don't see Russians supporting this as a, a value. Yeah? It's a much more Western concept. Finally, we have freedom of speech as an important goal for the next 10 years. This is probably where the Iron Curtain divide is most, <laughs> most visible. Um, and as we can see, and when I teach the Russians, they don't, they don't feel that they're missing something. They just feel that they have everything they want, and they don't, there's no sense of loss there. Yeah? It's just the way it, things are. Now, um, many Russian adolescents and young adults I met took the opportunity to express explicitly racist and homophobic viewpoints. They voiced displeasure with the Central Asian immigrants in their own country and those of African descent abroad though their grounds for complaint were often vague and anecdotal. They also found the concept of gay marriage endlessly fascinating, um, but considered homosexuality to be a kind of decadent Western lifestyle choice. After a year of living in the country, very few opinions about Western society or criticism of the Russian government surprised me. However, I had yet to hear any solution to the problems of corruption, economic volatility, and social insecurity. So, when we had exhausted all discussions of efficiency in meetings and office etiquette, I walked into an evening class and wrote this on the board. Um, you are Putin. This elicited laughter from the younger students and thoughtful expressions from those pushing 30. I asked, what would you do? How would you make life in Russia better? I was shocked by the answers that I heard. I'll tackle each of the comments individually, because I actually they were kind of etched into my memory. Um, but first, it's important to note that the majority of the respondents still did not come up with solutions. All right, number one, the government should build more factories to diversify the economy. Um, to any listener from the Western world, this response is truly mind-boggling. Um, this extremely Soviet idea that the government should be responsible for industry was surprising to hear from a 19-year-old. Next, we need another revolution. Um, while this might seem as the typical sarcastic outburst of any college student, it reveals, that the extreme, it reveals the extreme lack of faith all Russians, the youngest generations included, have in the potential for political change. Now, life in the Soviet Union, contrary to popular belief, did bring a few advantages, such as the elimination of illiteracy and homelessness. Um, However, every modern-day Russian is very aware of the Stalinist repressions and the atrocities that followed the October Revolution of 1917, not to mention the spiraling inflation and mass impoverishment of the 90s. Now, next, nothing will ever change because people like things the way they are, people like economic busts, people like Putin, people are stupid. Um, now, this is the most widespread of the views expressed by progressive Russians, young and old. I heard it from many residents in Russia, and it was the universal opinion of the Russians I met residing permanently in the UK and Ireland, the Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, Cyprus, and the United States. Due to the vastly increased mobility of our generation, I have met young people all over the world, Russian and otherwise, 
who choose to leave their own country, their home country, instead of fighting what they view as a losing battle. Now, it's important to note one thing here, that I, we've talked about migration a bit, but that Russia actually has the second biggest immigrant population in the world after the United States. Um, but it's important to know who are these immigrants. These are usually um, sort of working class immigrants from the former um, Soviet Union, the SNG countries, yes? Now, there is a parallel exodus of Russians, usually very educated Russians, from Moscow to Germany. Again, Germany is a special place here in the hearts of a lot of Russians. And um, therefore, um, it's important to note this because those who remain in Russia fre frequently exhibit a bipolar attitude towards these emigrants. On the one hand, the concept of Europe for Russians connotes luxury and well-being. Thus, Russian emigrants assume a certain prestige in their home country. Um, on the other hand, many Russians adopt a sort of sour grapes opinion, implying that contrary to popular belief, things are actually very similar in Russia and in European countries. Finally, things aren't all that bad. We have rational people in the government who are doing a good job in spite of global hostility. We all live better and make more money than our parents did and still people complain. This opinion is both the most troubling and the most illuminating of the lot. It is the fundamental reason why, to the incredulity of the West, Putin's popularity soars. There may be a ban on unsanctioned public demonstrations, but this mentality is among the, among the young is the real reason why there are no mass riots. The older generation feels cheated out of its life savings. The older generation feels severely disoriented in capitalist Russia, but the older generation is only angry babushkas, or grannies, who are rendered impotent by age and Soviet conditioning. The younger generation lives in a parallel world of social media, consumerism, and travel, and is not bothered by the plight of the old, as they say, um, that's what happens when an empire falls apart. The attraction of this positive outlook on Russia's situation lies in its psychological comfort, which on an individual level, level is much healthier than living in a morass of negativity about the situation in one's own country. But what does the young generation think about its place in the world, um, or about the future of the country? One would expect that Russians would be more concerned about their personal financial well-being than the prestige of the country. However, Russia is in many ways very much like America. Um, there was a deep-rooted patriotism that was misplaced in the 90s and early 2000s. The Russia I arrived in was fairly ambivalent about itself. People were making a lot of money, but reacted with surprise at my praise of Russian art, architecture, and literature. As soon as Putin gave his famous speech on the 18th of March last year, in support of Russia's annexation of Crimea four days later, hats, coats, pants, and even shoes appeared on people throughout Moscow bearing the country's name and flag. By the time I left Russia, it seemed like half of the commuters on the Moscow Metro were wearing Russia-themed apparel. However, it is important to note that these were chiefly the migrant workers from the Caucasus in Central Asia. The sheer irony of this display of patriotism among those sidelined by mainstream Russian society took my breath away. Now, in a country fearful of chaos and ambivalent about individual rights, it is hard to be optimistic. Regardless of the West's intentions, its insistence on Western values and political structures in Eastern societies has robbed Russians the wrong way. Russians of all ages perceive this as arrogance and insensitivity to cultural differences and call America's frequent wars in the name of freedom and democracy hypocritical. So um, Runyat, the Russian internet, is full of sort of random bits of propaganda. Sir? Ten minutes. All right. Thank you. I've got forty-five minutes, which is not forty. Okay. Okay. I'll I'll be fast. No, um, I'll be fast. That's ten minutes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this is a typical sort of. It's called a demotivator. It's a, a sort of thing you'd find on the Russian internet. Um, it says oil has been found in the Antarctic. The bloody penguin regime will be put to an end by the USA. This is a typical Russian humor. Uh, sorry, I love penguins, so that's great. Um, okay, uh, the Russian political and corporate systems 
which universally feature one leader ruling over comparatively powerless citizens or employees, have stood the test of time. I witness this not only in the government, like the rest of the world, but also in the public and private companies, small and large, that I worked in. Many of the employees didn't complain to me about it, but seemed to view this as a comfortable, normal state of affairs. And yet, despite the predominantly conservative society, Russian people are surprisingly adaptable to new conditions and ideas. There was a joke about it going around university, that um, in the event of a walking dead-style zombie apocalypse, um, all countries will perish, but life in Russia will continue as usual. And we may remember um, Chelyabinsk from February, uh, the story of the Russian drivers who see this kind of falling planet or whatever it is, um, and then continue driving without any, <laughs> no reaction, just a normal day in Chelyabinsk. Um, so um, Russia is not China. The Russian internet is open and overwhelmingly uncensored. Nearly all young people have access to global media, which not only means that Russia has a giant hipster problem, but that every corner of the country is now a window onto Europe. Thus, the young generation of new Russians is more prosperous, more educated, and more international than any generation that has come before it. This new internationalism is represented by affordable travel to destinations outside the former Soviet Union and an instant awareness of trends and ideas abroad. Like members of Generation Y around the world, Russian youth have higher expectations of government and society, though far more modest than those of young Westerners. I was stunned, oh, sorry, I was stunned by the intensity of debates among young Russians surrounding people and ideas in Paris and London. I mean, to me, Paris and London seemed absolutely irrelevant to daily life in Moscow, um, in spite of their geographical proximity. Then a realization hit me. There seems to be a tacit perception in Russia that new socio-political trends in the West will organically spread across Europe and in time reach the eastern end of the continent. History neither disproves or disproves this theory, but an event during my stay inclined me to believe it myself. Um, we may remember the June 2015 turn to the east. Um, Medvedev, um, here I'll, I'll start from where I left off. Um, I was already aware of the centuries-old battle of the Slavophiles and the Europhiles, which would seem rather quaint were it not 100% relevant to every Russian today. Um, however, it did not come to the fore of my experience until the 11th of June this year. Medvedev made the announcement, which I should clarify was entirely devoid of irony, um, that Russia would like to thank countries who passed anti-Russian sanctions as it has led to the nation's so-called turn to the East. As comical as this and other official statements may be, it sparked uproar among all of my young students. They associate China with everything wrong about Russia, in particular its pseudo-communist government, its low living standards, and its many human rights violations. While, this may, while there may be a little overt connection between the Russian government and its citizens, it was very interesting to read in September a rather conflicting headline. Medvedev denies Russia's turn to the East. So some may say, perhaps rightly, that this was a change of heart caused by the ensuing sharp decline in the Chinese economy. Um, it seems to me, however, that the new Russian government understands the fragility of the country and the necessity of peaceful citizens. While geopolitical developments in Eurasia are often impossible to predict, for young people in Russia, the future is definitely brighter than the past. So, thank you very much. Now, are there any, any questions, or is there time for questions? Oh, no, sure. Yeah? yeah. All right, quick, any, any so, lightning so, questions? This is how, no, no, stay yeah. here. All right. I make a comment. Oh, That's okay. That's my feudal privilege. Uh, homelessness was not eliminated, it was controlled. Russia or the Soviet Union had tougher uh, residency laws than apartheid South Africa. You've all heard about Bantustans, Shantitans, etc. That would have been impossible in the Soviet Union. The tight control of the population reduced everybody to slavery. So they could claim there was no homelessness because everybody stayed in one place unless one, one was completely whacked, and there were people, homeless, who traveled incessantly, so they weren't until they were caught. And they were put away into the gulag as late as the 1980s for vagrancy. As far as literacy is concerned, 
would pray tell me they were going to read Soviet propaganda. That is why uh, literacy was eradicated, illiteracy was eradicated, to make sure everybody was indoctrinated and hence you had all those problems. Mm. So would you rather have taught illiterates logic from the very beginning or would you rather reckon with the people you had to reckon with? And that is a big problem. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, do you see? So, unfortunately, two-edged sword. Go ahead. Any questions? Go ahead, yeah. Mr. Chong. On uh, November 12th, there was a strike by Russian truck drivers. Mm -hmm. One of their banners showed, we don't want to suffer for the benefit of Russian oligarchs. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Among yeah. your um, uh, bourgeois and uh, middle class uh, students, was there any feeling that uh, they or their parents are being um, exploited by the oligarchs? That, they, that uh, any feeling that they don't want further sacrifice for the oligarchs? Absolutely. Yeah, that was a very common theme of conversations with really any, especially middle class, because the middle class is probably the most vulnerable group in Russian society. It's very small, as you can imagine, and it is essentially dependent on the crony capitalism which happens in the upper classes. So you're absolutely right. That was a very common concern. Thank you. One more question. John mm -hmm. Yemchin. Uh, you mentioned that there's a great fascination with Germany and Yes. But there's also a great deal of mention of fascism and the mm -hmm. fascism. And has, has that become disconnected in the, in the, in the youth mind or in Russian minds? Could that connection with fascism in Germany and the great fascism, you know, battle against fascism? Well, I, if I can answer that with a very, very brief story, because this is exactly what came up right before I left, and that is a fascinating question as to. The history, which is very anti-fascist, therefore anti-Nazi, therefore we can say anti-German. Um, and then the current perception of Germany as a very moralistic country in terms of its international relations. And I had a wonderful student from the Caucasus, very well-off lady, whose father became very ill. Yes, And they were a very patriotic family from the Caucasus. And he had to be sent to Germany. And this is a normal situation. A lot of any, any Russian who has a lot of money who becomes ill is sent to Germany. And because of the healthcare system. And he came back and he told her one thing which I couldn't believe. Um, he, he's, you know, he's, this man maybe is 90. He came back and he said, um, I think the Germans won the war. Because if you look at the standard of living, you know, this is how we measure societies in a lot of countries in the world, they have a much higher standard of living. So many Russians would kind of put aside any anti fascist tendencies and just say, listen, this is a new country, and it's, you know, it's better off. Also, the Russians now project their hatred of fascism with, uh, onto Ukraine. Further, their hatred of fascism is, is expressed in Stalinist mm -hmm. terms. Most of the time, it entails embracing uh, the Soviet past which is not exactly what we want to see. No, no, fascism is a form of socialism, naturally, so we hate it. Uh, uh, national socialism is a form of socialism, so we hate it, as all uh, decent human beings should. However, in the Russian setting, it mostly means embracing Stalin and the past. So it's not so much anti-German as integrative within in Russia. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. This was fantastic. See?